we're talking about the nine votes that'll determine millions of votes in America. That's right, this week a new slate of voting restrictions got their day in front of the Supreme Court. Now when you talk about restricting votes, there are generally two different questions that float to the top of the pile. Can you do it and should you do it? Now this episode is going to be firmly focused on the more morally neutral question of can you do it? With that in mind, let's get right into the consolidated cases of Brnovich v the DNC and Arizona Republican Party v the DNC. Yeah, these voting rights cases split people down party lines more than gerrymandering. Now, the point of contention here revolves around two Arizona laws. One is a policy that requires an entire ballot be thrown away if it were cast in the wrong precinct, and the other is a state law that bars ballot harvesting. All right, so million dollar question: Can they do that? Now, states are free to run their elections pretty much however they want. But the Voting Rights Act of 1968 provided legal protection from taking away voting opportunities for certain protected minorities. Now, these new laws could be the biggest thing to depress minority turnout since Hillary Clinton's nomination. So, do these two policies suppress minority voting opportunities? Well, it depends on how expensive your lawyer is. The current test to evaluate whether something is happening a bit below board with these laws is called the results test. Doesn't matter what the law is, if the result is less opportunities for a protected minority, that's a chop. Now, to illustrate the mechanics of this test, we go to the Court of Appeals decision being reviewed by the Supreme Court today. Now, this test has two steps. First, you ask the question of whether the challenge practice results in a disparate burden on members of a protected class. Well, that sounds like the relevant question here. What's the second follow-up question? Are you sure? The answer to this question for today's case is yes. These laws disparately burden protected minorities. No, I'm not going to spend a bunch of time litigating this argument because nobody is disputing that fact. Unfortunately for advocates, the mere existence or bare statistical showing of a disparate impact on a racial minority in and of itself is not sufficient. If it was, this would be an incredibly short episode. Now, To get a little more specific, the follow-up question is a bit more confusing. Whether there is a link between the challenge law and social and historical conditions creating an inequality in opportunities. Now, I really want to emphasize that last word opportunities because how you interpret that word will really determine where you fall in this debate. The conservative interpretation of lack of opportunity is literally turning away or limiting someone's ability to vote. Sorry, you can't vote here because yada yada yada. The progressive interpretation of a lack of opportunity to vote is Everyone can vote, but we put a fun little wipeout style obstacle course in front of every inner city bowling place. Have fun. The Arizona Republican lawyer Michael Carvin came out swinging on this point. He stressed that by enforcing the out of precinct policy in the ballot harvesting van, Arizona was not denying anyone the opportunity to vote, unlike for example a literacy test would. Yeah, you show up to the right place and you can vote. We're just not going to put in the effort to correct mistakes. Now, This incredibly nuanced debate on what constitutes an opportunity might make this debate sound very inconsequential. I mean, for once the winning argument might actually start with the phrase Webster's Dictionary defines. But this new conservative interpretation of opportunity would cede an immense amount of power to the states. Specifically, it would allow them to control when the polls are open and where polling places are located, as long as they aren't turning people away when they get there. The toughest critic of this interpretation was Justice Kagan, who took the conservative lawyer to task. At one point, they had quite the debate over limiting the court's interpretation of opportunity to just not turning people away. Uh, the state says we're placing all our polling places at country clubs, and that decision means that black voters have to drive ten times as long to the polls and uh, uh, have to go into places which um, 
you know, are traditionally uh, hostile to them? Yeah, I would think that would provide them with less opportunity than non-minorities. And why is that? Well, because they have to travel further into hostile territory where non-minorities can can travel one uh, block to very sympathetic. Now, that might sound incredibly obvious to you and me, but that was a huge concession from the conservative side. Saying polling locations are open to everyone, equal opportunity, but they're only going to be located in country clubs makes opportunities less equal. So limiting locations can, in some circumstances, limit opportunities, even if everyone's welcome. She went on to argue the other major conservative point. You can control times when the polls open and close as long as you're not turning people away. The state says um, we're going to have election day voting only, and it's going to be from 9 to 5. And there's plenty of evidence on the record that voters of one races are 10 times more likely to work a job that wouldn't allow them to vote during that time period. Is that system equally open? Now, this led to an extended debate about what specific time limitations would constitute a lack of opportunity. But after a few minutes of talking, they settled on the fact that opening for 15 minutes in the middle of a workday would constitute a lack of opportunity for workers who are predominantly protected minorities. Now, this might all seem like a weird tangent to go down, but at this point, judges were just trying to carve out outer extremes. The Republican lawyers seating that all-inclusive polls with incredibly restrictive locations or closing times would pose a lack of opportunity for protected minorities was a major hit to his interpretation of what an opportunity is. Now, A lot of progressive Supreme Court watchers starting this debate saw this new limited interpretation of opportunity as a worst case scenario. But my magic eight ball is coming up, don't count on it. Still, none of what I have said so far means disregarding ballots deposited out of precinct or making ballot harvesting a felony would limit opportunities for protected minorities. It just means that this limiting opportunities argument is a valid legal objection in the cases of limiting where all inclusive polling locations a person can vote would happen. Baby steps. So. Are these specific laws egregious enough to be considered limiting minority protected voting opportunities? Now, this more specific debate led to some pretty, we'll just say, controversial quotes from Chief Justice John Roberts. Results in a 1% decline uh, in participation by minority voters. Is that substantial enough? I mean, 1%, according to the statistical analysis, has been denied uh, the opportunity to vote. Why is that substantial? Yeah, guys, don't worry. It's just a touch of suppression for an aging democracy that wants to look a little bit more like it did back in the 1950s. So is limiting about 1% of a protected minority's access to the ballot box considered restricting opportunities? Well, under the current tests, yes. Now, seeing this, the conservative judges looked at their hands and said, You know what? You're right. Protected minority opportunities are being limited here. We, we really need to change something. Can we get a new test? Let's stop focusing so much on opportunities and start evaluating the voting laws themselves. Now, this new perspective was best illustrated in an argument made by Justice Alito. I think uh, uh, what concerns me is that your position is going to make every voting rule vulnerable to attack under Section 2 to the same extent that the out-of-precinct policy is, uh, w was found to, to violate Section 2 by the Ninth Circuit. Uh, because uh, people who are poor and less well-educated, on balance, probably will find it more difficult to comply with just about every voting rule than do people who are more affluent and have had the benefit of more education. He's right. Most attempts to restrict voting fall disproportionately on poor people. Some would argue that's a terrific reason for not restricting voting. 
Not the conservative justices in this case though. The state was implementing these restrictions citing the legitimate compelling interest of election security to justify the restrictions. Now up to this point I haven't mentioned that compelling interest because it is irrelevant to the current 1-2 test of limiting minority opportunities. Currently the test simply asks, does this law disproportionately limit minority voting opportunities for protected minorities? Yeah? Well then that's a chop. Now some judges are looking at the test and saying, wow that view is a bit too restrictive. Now in response to this new concern by some conservative justices, DNC lawyer Bruce Spiva came out of the gate just ready to compromise. His position was, don't worry conservatives, you can still get away with a whole lot by abusing the current test. Let's just maintain the status quo, please. In 2016, the court saw a similar case when Virginia strengthened their voter ID laws. People sued claiming this had a disparate impact on protected minorities voting opportunities and the courts, using the same opportunity test they're using today, overruled those objections. The standard that we uh, support, Your Honor, has been applied in numerous cases over the last uh, decade. And I'll give you an example, uh, voter ID. Uh, in the Lee versus uh, Virginia State Board of Elections uh, uh, case, uh, voter ID was, was upheld there because the court found that there wasn't a disparate uh, impact uh, because the state provided free IDs in that context. Again, using the totality of the circumstances test came to the conclusion that voter ID in Virginia uh, was, was, uh, was, was permissible and Section 2 didn't require it being struck down. Yeah, if you put in restrictive voting laws that disproportionately burden protected minorities, but you then put in protections to give them the same opportunities to vote, well there's no problem. It's just when you shrug and say, okay maybe 1% of minorities might be disenfranchised. That's when the courts start giving you the old side eye. For example, Arizona could have banned ballot harvesting while creating a program that went to Native American reservations with no connection to the postal service and collected their ballots. They just didn't. With the judicial deck stacked the way it is at the Supreme Court right now, the progressive lawyer found himself in an interesting game theory situation. Here are the judges listed on an ideological spectrum. You have the three liberal justices who wouldn't mind keeping the program the way it is. And you have the six conservative justices who want to make some changes in how the court tests for voting rights legislation violations. Read the room progressives, they're not buying what you're selling. Now the goal for the progressive lawyer was to pitch the least radical reinterpretations to voting rights law and hopefully chip off two of the conservative judges to join with the liberals. The progressive compromise test is the Stephanopoulos test. That test would take into account not only whether a practice disproportionately affects minorities, but it would also let the state provide its own rationale, having nothing to do with race, for that practice. Now under these circumstances, this legal debate would look a little bit different. Arizona would say, look, we have these laws to enhance election security. The plaintiff would say, yeah, but they disenfranchise 1% of a protected minority class in your state. And it would be up to the court to evaluate the practicality of the state's laws and weigh the pros and cons. The conversation would no longer abruptly end at that 1% disenfranchisement. Now this is similar to a separate new test proposed by Judge Kavanaugh, the swing vote in this case, that would go a bit further to the right than this Stephanopoulos test. In his test, Kavanaugh would have the courts consider other factors, such as whether a rule is widely used in other states and whether there is good justification for that rule. Now this is similar to the Stephanopoulos test, except on top of a state's compelling interest being a defense, you could also cite things like, but you let Texas get away with it. This is so unfair. I'm going to my room. So those are the major options to resolve this issue being considered by the court. Now I realize that this episode has been a non-stop barrage of new legal nuance. So let me take a second to clean up after myself a bit. <laughs> 
There are four major potential outcomes of this debate. First, we have the radical progressive outcome of status quo. Every policy that disproportionately limits opportunities for protected minorities to vote is getting the axe. Or on the other side, you have the conservative extreme that says states can have complete control over locations and opening times for polling places, and only policies that disproportionately turn away protected minorities from the polls could be considered limiting opportunities and get the chop. Then you have the more compromised positions of states can argue that they have a compelling interest in a policy that would disproportionately limit opportunities of protected minorities, and will consider it. Or on the other side, states can argue compelling interests or cite other outside sources like other state peer pressure as the reason for those policies being implemented. The future of voting rights hang in the balance of the decision in this case. And until we find out what the decision is, thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, I think this is a super important underreported debate. If you liked this video, why not share it with your friends? If you hated it, why not share it with your enemies? I'd like to thank my patrons over here for helping me put out my videos. If you want to support independent, nonpartisan news looking into the overlooked, join this growing list of exceptional individuals by clicking on that link in the description. Also remember to subscribe and ring that bell so that freedom will continue to ring. Give me a thumbs up if you liked what you saw. And lastly, as always, thank you for watching.